Hello, this is Russell coming to you from the Tate Geological Museum at Casper College in Wyoming. And today I'm going to talk to you about how we can look at the shape of a seashell and work out the soft tissue anatomy of the snail that used to live inside of it. Um, first of all, ever obviously, every shell has to have an opening so that the snail's head and foot can get in and out of the shell. And that is called the aperture. And here you can see the aperture of a channeled whelk. And if you hold up a shell so that the spire is pointing upwards, then the aperture is almost always to the right. So these two channeled whelk specimens show the usual, the typical position of that aperture. Now, there are very few exceptions to this, but I've got one right here. This is the lightning whelk, Busicon perversus. That's not as naughty as it sounds. In this context, perversus just means contrary to the usual condition. And here, when you point the spire upwards, you can see the aperture opens up to the left. Very, very few gastropods have it in that arrangement. Now, uh, young gastropods undergo a process called torsion. Nobody really knows why, but the gastropod starts out like this, which is very close to the arrangement that the ancestral gastropod is thought to have had way back in the Cambrian period. And then the visceral mass on top of its body with the internal organs inside and the mantle cavity and the gills turns around. It rotates 180 degrees so that now the opening to the mantle cavity is facing forward instead of backward. Now that means that most of the visceral mass is now over the animal's body instead of over its head. So that's good, but the other consequence is not so good. Now the wastewater and the fecal pellets leaving the mantle cavity are going forward, emptying out on top of the snail's head and getting mixed in with oxygenated fresh water coming in from outside. The soft tissue anatomy of gastropods shows a lot of band-aid solutions to this problem that's brought about by the process of torsion. Now, one of the simplest is to have an exhalant siphon. That's a tube running from the mantle cavity and exiting the animal's body some distance away from the opening of the um, mantle cavity where the water is coming in. And Mollusks that solve the problem this way are called archaeogastropods. They're thought to be the more primitive group of mollusks. And uh, here we've got a good example of that, the keyhole limpet, Diodera. And in the middle of the shell, you see a little tiny hole. And when he was alive, the exhalant siphon was sticking out of that and emptying the deoxygenated wastewater into the surrounding sea. Uh, another familiar archaeogastropod, which uh, shows uh, a solution to the problem, is the abalone. So here is the uh, shell of an abalone, Haliotis, and these holes are called tremata. And when it's alive, there's uh, the exhalant siphon sticking out through the hole and emptying that wastewater into the sea. As it grows larger, it develops more tremata around the edges. And then meanwhile, the others are being sealed up uh, closer to the spire. So there's another example of an archaeogastropod. Now, most snails belong to a much larger and more advanced group called the um, cenogastropods. And what they've done is pretty much solve the problem the opposite way. They have a tube called an inhalant siphon, which sucks water in from some distance away from the mantle cavity, pumps it over the gills, and that way uh, it doesn't get mixed in with the wastewater leaving. Those uh, gastropods that have that siphon will often have a fold of the aperture surrounding and protecting it called the siphonal canal. And you can see that very clearly on this snail shell right there. So when you see that siphonal canal, you know that there was a long tube, that inhalant siphon sticking out there and uh, sucking the water in from some distance away from the rest of the ma uh, mantle cavity. One of my favorites is uh, this one here. This is Murex trapa, which goes by the common name of the rare spined murex, although I got this one for $1.80 at Pier 1 Imports, so it couldn't have been that rare, at least not back then. And uh, 
they have a very long siphonal canal showing us betraying the presence of a very long siphon. Once again, drawing water in from some distance away. Now, um, they've modified this in several ways in different uh, Cenogastropod lineages. Here's Cassis, the helmet shell. And on this one, the siphonal canal is turned almost 90 degrees. It goes through a complete curve here. This is a mollusk that enjoys plowing through the mud at the sea bottom, which is a good way to find food. But the problem is that then the water coming into your mantle is carrying suspended bits of grit that might uh, damage your gills. Well, no problem for Cassis. It's got the siphon coming up and sticking uh, dorsally like the smokestack of a train and that can suck water up from above the level of the sediment and that way it uh, isn't breathing muddy water in over its gills. And then there are the conch uh, group of snails, the strombidae, and this is the largest and most familiar of that group. This is uh, a strombus gigas, the uh, queen conch, and uh, they've got a siphonal canal, and they've also got an extra notch right here called the stromboid notch. And uh, when it's alive, not only is the siphonal canal sticking through there, but also one of its eye stalks. And then this uh, stromboid notch provides a bit of room for the other eye stalk to come out through there. So they can uh, look with their eye stalks using those two notches to give them a better view of their surroundings. So that's kind of the trademark of the family Strombidae, the conch family. Another thing about conchs is that the operculum has been modified into a, a stout claw, and they can use that for gripping onto rocks or coral heads and help keep their place in rough seas. So there's usually another sinus back here to make room for that claw-like appendage on the conch shell. Now there's a, another genus of conchs, the Lambus uh, genus, which includes the Chiragra spider conch, and the scorpion spider conch, uh, Lambus scorpius, uh, right here. And although these apertural spines there uh, make it look very different at first glance from a queen conch, you can see that stromboid notch there betraying those two eye stalks coming out there and giving it a better view. So there's the, whoops, wrong fingers. There's the stromboid notches on the Chiragra spider conch. More advanced still are the Murex group of sea snails. This is Chitcoreus ramosus, which is a large Murex. Here we've got the siphonal canal forward for drawing in fresh oxygenated water, but they've also got an extra canal right here. You can just see the notch right there where an exhalant siphon, a separate exhalant siphon, would be exiting the body. So they get the best of both worlds. They're both getting fresh oxygenated water from up here and then getting rid of the waste water way back here at the completely opposite end of the animal. Tutufa bubo is another snail that's taken that uh, route. And you can very clearly see the inhalant siphonal canal at this end and not hard at all to spot the exhalant siphon canal on the back of the aperture right there. So these uh, are what those different features are for on modern snails. And of course, this is very important to people in my line of work because those also help us to reconstruct the soft tissue anatomy of snails that are now extinct. All right, and that's what I have to say about snails. Thank you very much for listening.